Okay, so I start the meeting and I'm looking for my agenda that I printed on so I can read it. <clears throat> Connor, I okay. think I I think I beat you here. <laughs> oh, can't hear him. Now we can't hear Connor. Oh. Are there any changes to the agenda as we get started? I have no changes, but Mike, you do sound a little muffled on there. I do? You do. I don't... Yeah. Th that could be the speaker okay. in the room, but... <laughs> Did Connor say something? Connor, he, can we... He tried. Yeah. There you oh, go. Okay. You're muted. Okay. You know I wasn't muted, but I, is it fixed now? Yep, we got yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, all I said was, Joe, I don't know how you did that. <laughs> <laughs> I literally left right next door. Oh. <laughs> I ran cross country. <laughs> okay, so no changes to the agenda. Uh, are there any folks from the public uh, here tonight? Eric? There, there is one member of the public on. Uh, Michael, if you are interested in speaking for items not on the agenda, you can uh, raise your hand and we'll recognize you. Otherwise, um, we can recognize you later on the agenda. Okay, that's a hand raised. So uh, you can go ahead and unmute yourself, Michael, and, and speak. Uh, hi, um, I, I just wanted to uh, give a brief public comment in support of revising uh, the parking minimums uh, that are the proposed changes to parking minimums that are outlined, um, and would ask you to um, consider, uh, you know, in terms of you know, for, for, for the purposes of uh, you know increasing affordability and meeting our climate goals to yeah, follow Michael. recommendations from the. Michael. Yeah. Michael, I just want to interrupt for a second. Are you rushed for time? Because we'll be talking about this in a Yeah, I, I actually have to go to another thing later. All right, that, that is fine. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, so, so, so I just asked you to consider um, you know, significantly reducing parking requirements in Winooski to enable uh, more affordable development patterns, uh, smaller uh, apartment sizes, things that can help us to reduce our transportation emissions and increase uh, bus and walk mode share. Um, and I'd ask you to consider following all the recommendations from the uh, Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission parking study uh, that was conducted earlier this year um, around reducing uh, residential uh, parking requirements. Uh, so thanks. Okay, thank you, Michael. So, Eric, no other members of the public out there? Uh, there are not. Are you sure? <laughs> okay. So, we'll move on then. Uh, approval of the previous meeting minutes. Looking for a motion and a second. I'll move to approve them. I do have one correction, though. Um, sure. I, have, before I, you do that, Joe, is there a second? Yeah, but how do you... How do you correct if you approve? You, 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 well, it's, so he makes a motion to accept the minutes with edits. Okay. You second it, and then we have discussion. Okay, I, I'll second it. Okay. It, it's nothing substantive that I have. Yeah. It's, just, it's just that I think the heading says 1 13 22, and it should read 11. Oh, uh, but the date? Yeah. Any other? Sorry, um, sorry, Joe, what, what were you looking at on that? I actually might be mistaken. Never mind. Carry on. <laughs> so not an edit. Not an edit. Okay. Okay. Anyone else have any edits, comments, questions about the minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye or raise your hand. I... I Joe, you said I, I'm assuming, and Connor? Well, I'm abstaining just because I wasn't in the last meeting. Okay. I... And all against and abstentions, Connor. Okay. So those pass. So next item, I think we're moving on to. Oops. Can we get to the right place? Bum, 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 bum. Uh, come on. Sorry. Technical problem with my other computer here. Uh, so we got continued discussion on Article 4, Sections 4 1 through 4 12. Um, Eric, I will throw it over to you. 
Yep, thank you very much. Um, I know, Sarah, you had wanted to, uh, so, sorry, let me back up a step. So at our last meeting, we were, um, we started our discussion on parking uh, in section 4.12. Uh, Sarah reached out to, to want to briefly revisit um, the incentives in under the design review section. So Sarah, I don't know if you wanted to go back to that now or uh, if you still wanted to, to revisit that at this point. Um, I think the, the, the revisit I wanted to do was, I, I think, or am I correct in saying that we're all feeling okay about this, that we want to move this forward for the most part? Is that? The section on incentives, you mean? On the incentives, yeah. So, so let's, I, I, I had a conversation with Sarah and one with Eric as well. Um, I'm going to suggest that we revisit, maybe briefly, section 4.4. Yeah. The, the design review and the um, incentives and talk about keeping the design review language in as it as it presently exists rather than striking it and putting the incentives into an appropriate um, area and I think it's five point am I right three five point one five five point one five okay yeah folks uh, Abby, Connor, and Joe, do you follow what I'm suggesting? Is it 4.4? Yes. 4.4 is the design review area. I'm suggesting let's leave that in as currently written. We can we can um, come back to it at some later point to, to revise it, edit it, or whatever we might want to do. But for yeah. now, leave it in there. And Eric, maybe you can let the rest of the planning commission know your i think you had a conversation with the attorney yeah so let me do a quick screen share here just to so everybody can see what we're talking about so right now as is drafted um we were talking about um the language in section 4.14 currently talks about design review as we meant as we talked about a little bit i believe at our last meeting um, we don't really have a mechanism for design review. There's no design review district. That's a, this is a carryover from a previous version of the regulations. So the initial thought was to, to build in some level of, of preservation standard was to uh, create some incentives while we work on some component of design review or other preservation elements, uh, which is where the language is, the, the new language proposed is coming from. After a conversation I had with our attorney recently about another issue, I'm more inclined to leave the language of design review as it is, as it's written, so we still have the design review language included under section 4.4, but then also add in this new language for the uh, incentives for adaptive reuse in a new section 5.15. So in essence, we'd be keeping what's already written even though it's shown as a strikeout now, we would keep all that language as it is, not, not change that at all, so that there is still the basis for a design review component. We could revisit that in the future to bolster that language, add in standards for design review, the, uh, the design review districts, the boards, other things that we've talked about previously, but then also add in this section 5.15 for the, the incentives for adaptive reuse. That's, I think, the, the, the better direction to go in uh, at this point, so that we're not eliminating everything related to design review and we have nothing in place. At least right now, we do have something. So we would continue to keep that so there's something in place while we work on new language for design review. And then the incentive, we're going to bundle that with this parking conversation, and that would all go forward to the council. So, yes, so the incentive language, we would add that into a new section 5.15. As you recall, the incentives we did for priority housing, we created a new section 5.14. So it would follow in that same vein of incentives being included in Article 5. So that would be part of this package of amendments that we would take forward. Really, in essence, what we would do is take forward, my intent was everything from section 4.1 through 4.12, we would take forward as a package of amendments to council, including section a new section 5.15 on incentives for adaptive reuse and some additional language on, uh, sorry, some additional definitions to, uh, to make sure we have consistency with 
the various sections of, of uh, the various language. Sorry, we have consistency with the terms used in 4.1 through 4.12. Got it. Yeah. That makes sense. So within that, I just did want to talk a tiny bit more about garage sheds and other similar structures because I know Joe brought that up last time. Um, that maybe some of those buildings are interesting, right? Can you pick that up, Joe, at all? Yeah, I think that's accurate. Okay. In some cases, perhaps more actually significant than maybe the primary structure. Yeah, so how do we incorporate that into the incentive possibility? Or does it not work under incentive? I don't know. Well, I guess that's the question. Um, is if the, I guess one, I would ask, do, do we know where examples of that exists in the city? Right. And, and two, if so, we, that's fine. And, and I think if we know that there are examples, I think we can um, potentially under the applicability portion here, we can rewrite this so that it, it clarifies that if, the, if there is an accessory structure or something else that is historically significant, that would be the context of what we wanted to, to preserve. Yeah, I can, I can only attest to the fact that um, I know in some instances where properties have been included in like the state register, mm -hmm. um, there are oftentimes like complementary structures that are included in the listing. Right. Um, and they're probably, I mean, I don't have, you know, a definitive list off the top of my head, but I did cite at the last meeting an instance of it where like a property that's on the state historic register where they had a pretty large carriage barn behind the house. It's now used as like, it was a former artist studio space, but now is like they were considering um, converting it into um, a dwelling unit. Mm -hmm. um, and wondering about what grant funding might be available because there is like, um, there are certain grants available for Vermont barns because that's kind of a unique part of the landscape. Sure. And so they were kind of pursuing what they might be able to get for funding to restore that building and adaptive reuse into a dwelling. Um, I think it does have benefit to include structures like that. Um, yeah, so that's absolutely let me, let me just throw out, I was just thinking, trying to go through my mind, some examples of, of that kind of structure. And, and besides the one at Joe's, uh, I was thinking of, of on the corner of Weaver and Union Street, the, the Roy property. Right. The big barn and back. That, I think that would be an example of a structure like that. Right, uh, right. And Britta, Mike, did, Britta okay. did identify one in the, the document that she put together, didn't she? One of the barns or structures. So basically, Eric, yeah. I guess to answer the question is yes, there are some. <laughs> sure. Yeah, and to, to Mike's point, yeah. just that was that's actually very illustrative of the point I was just making. That that's yeah. an instance where actually the barn is the more significant structure than the dwelling unit, um, historically speaking. Um, it's a pretty large structure there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I yeah, I can. Uh, I can add some language that clarifies that if it's the if there's if it's not the primary structure that is the significant one, then we would look to to have some level of preservation for incentives incentives to preserve the the accessory structure. Yes, great. And I guess I would also say that you know just because we're moving on from this section and looking at, at 412, sorry, yeah, 412, we will come back and, and review everything before we set a public hearing so that all the language has been, been re-reviewed and there's nothing that we, we have missed or overlooked as we go forward. So there will be another opportunity to look at this language. Okay. And Bryn, I just want to make sure that, that you know, chime in whenever and wherever you want, okay? Great, thanks. I actually did have a quick question. Um, so, I, based off of the just the discussion here, it looks like the applicability. So right now it's four point four B. Um, so these regulations shall not apply to garages, sheds, or similar structures. That would all be revised. Yes. Okay. Yep. Great. Yep. Okay. Um, all right. Anything else on this before we jump back into parking? Awesome. Is, is everyone ever, so? I'm, from no comments, I'm assuming everyone on the commission is comfortable with where we're going with this. 
I feel more comfortable now that Eric's run a past the city attorney and it seems like he's given us some good guidance on it. Yeah, and I'll talk a little bit more about that relation later under uh, city updates, just to give you more more context with that. Um, I don't want to I don't want to get into that now, but we'll get into that later on. So thank you. Um, okay, so are we? So we're good to move on to parking. Let me just make sure. Okay, so I'm just going to zip ahead here in the document, real quick. Apologies for the scrolling. All right, so parking. So we really just kind of touched on some of this at our last meeting. Um, primary changes at this point were I removed the reference to no maximum parking, which was at the under item C here under minimum reserved. Um, so we still, <laughs> does everyone still feel okay that it don't have, that we're not putting a cap on? In other words, I know we talked about it last time. So we removed it just so it wasn't a topic of, I don't know, Eric, I just had that moment when you said, well, you know, this plot, you know, we don't have that many spaces in Winooski that this could happen. Um, but I'm starting to get nervous about those kind of statements without actually saying we do have a maximum parking. Does anybody else have a yeah. feeling? Yeah, I do share that, Sarah. Okay. Ask, like, if you have any like, strong feelings about that, like yeah. there's a number in mind. Or well, a recommended number of error. Well, so I guess I would say in my experience with, with uh, working with developers here in the city since I've, since I've been here, there is no one that has wanted to build any more parking than they absolutely need to. And in fact, everybody wants to, wants to find ways to build less. So I don't know if we have any areas where, um, where putting a maximum would, would really apply, but I mean, it's something we can look at. It's going to, I mean, it'll need, we'll need to do some additional work on that if we do want to install maximums just because each use will be different. So it's not like we could, although we could also say, you know, that they can't exceed a certain percentage of the required parking, the minimum required as a maximum, but I don't, um, I don't foresee anybody trying to build more than they need to just because it's costly and there's not a ton of land in the city. But yeah, I mean, we can look at that if you want to incorporate a maximum, uh, a maximum cap on parking. I personally am comfortable with, without it in there, but I'm one of seven, so. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can, we can, let's, let's talk about it. Um, Cause I'm not, it's kind of a foreign concept to me, but just for the fact that I, I agree with what you're saying, Eric, I'm not sure that, that it's necessarily applicable in mm -hmm. yeah. here, especially, so you know, especially, yeah, anyway. It seems to be a bit of a non-issue. Like I, if there's no ever, I mean, what, what I can do is look at the, the numbers that we have. So we've, we've gone through the table once, and I do have a few updates just to highlight that I've made since our last discussion. So what I can do is look at the table, see if there's, and kind of get a sense of what a maximum might look like, and if there's a way to kind of do it based on a percentage so that we could, so that we potentially could just say, parking shouldn't exceed X percentage of the minimum. So if we mm -hmm. want to if we want to go in that direction that way we're not looking at individual uses and saying well this residential use you can only have six spaces even though you've got room to put in 10 and that would accommodate all the units you have you know i um you know it's it, it can be tricky to to get to that number so i can i can look at the numbers a bit and see if there's a way to to establish maybe a percentage of maximum is but, there is there any and, and I guess I would come from and I don't know if this makes sense or not um, like most stuff that I bring up but anyway um, a, a percentage is fine but maybe if it exceeds a certain percentage over the minimum it requires um, it probably doesn't DRB approval something like that we could we could do something like that sure does, does that make any sense I mean because I personally don't want to limit it. If someone wants to put in, you know, 20 spaces, they only need five. All right, that's their choice. Um, 
you know, but but let them explain it to the DRB why they're doing that. Well, you know what I said last time, my fear was just that you get a a drugstore or a, one of the chains, They do, the chains do put those more parking in that they, than they know they need. Um, is it possible that in the future something happens that we, there is property that some sort of chain would want to do that? Um, I don't know. I'm just being extra cautious about the future yeah. more than nobody's ever done it before. Do you know yeah. what I'm saying? And I guess when I think about that, it's like, well, I mean, again, that's, you know, that's their decision. And if that's what they want to use the, 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 the land for, I mean, if they do it in the gateway, we have provisions it's going to be in the back anyway. So it's not going to be seen. Right. So that's what they want to do. What right. Want to do. In the gateways, there's limitations on where the parking can be located. In the downtown core, it, it's also um, there's there's some limitations on where it can be located. Um, trying to think. I mean, I'm you know I'm just bringing it up. I maybe I'm yeah. sorry. I, I um, hear. I just feel like. Yeah, I hear. I hear what you're. I hear never what you're saying, before. Sarah, with like where you can yeah. picture, you can picture places that are very suburban where there's like really a lot of land use that's wasted on massive amounts of parking that only get used maybe once or twice a year. Mm -hmm. um, I, I appreciate that. I'm just kind of wondering, is there in fact any utility to this? And I'm, I'm thinking back to like Mike O'Brien's um, recollections about like the downtown redevelopment era, like back in the early 2000s and trying to attract a supermarket here. And it was the opposite factor. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm just kind of wondering if this might be even more tipping the scales in another direction that perhaps there are services that we would want in Winooski that we're not going to get because we put a cap for some reason. Okay, that's fair. I don't know. Yeah, I, and then just for, again, some val validation for you, Sarah, um, I can see the need to minimize impervious surfaces um, for storm runner, runoff, um, that all would have to be managed by our wastewater system. That's non-point source water that has to be managed and treated. Um, I think about the, the canopy, the urban canopy, need for green space, um, things like that, that um, could be a factor. So, uh, you know, I, I appreciate the question that you're raising, Sarah, and um, Mike, the creative thought behind, you know, if there is an increase, a, a desire in having over the minimum, then perhaps having DRB um, consider that as well. So I think it's fair not to limit it in the ordinance. I, I think that's a good compromise. I think if it like you're bringing it before the DRB and saying, here's why, like that actually makes sense. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm comfortable with that. And I was just perusing to see what other um, jurisdictions were doing. Um, and when you are not when you ski Burlington is 125%. Their maximum is 125% above their minimum. So maybe that's the threshold that we use for DRB review. Yeah, that's actually what I was thinking. Something in the 120 to 125 range was is typically what I've seen as well for, for a maximum percentage above the what's required. That's Burlington, you said, Abby? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And good on you for finding that so quickly. <laughs> yeah. I wonder what she was doing. About you. <laughs> about you being able to do this virtually, like, my other screen. <laughs> um, so, is it, so, so I, I guess that's what we'll do is is put the one point two five. If it's over that, then it, it's going to go through DRB review or. Or yeah. be explained by DRB to whatever. Yep, I'll, yeah, I'll no, write in some. Be, I can write in some language be, for that. Yeah. 125 percent yeah. of the minimum. Yep. Yeah. Right. So we're not limiting it to it, but we're saying if you're going to go over that, you need to explain it. Yeah. yeah. And what I don't understand, and it was always helpful to have um, Amy because she had done the DRB, but um, Eric, I know you oversee both. She had sort of indicated that the DRB review isn't, they don't really have much power to review anything that's not like stated in some standard. So how would they, if we sent this off to review, to the DRB for review, how would they 
be able to yay or nay something like this? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it may be that we could look to like the conditional use standards as far as what would be the their standard of review. But yeah, you're right. There needs to be some level, some standard of review for the for the DRV to follow in that instance. So it may be that anything above that percentage would would trigger review by the DRB and, and they would need to follow a standard of review for similar to conditional use or something else. We could even come up with our own standard of review for that to say that there needs to be X, Y, and Z in order for them to, to, to justify why they need the additional parking. Is, is there enough? Go ahead, Mike. Uh, I was just going to say, is it enough to, to put in the regulations something to the effect of, of the in, the intent of why we're putting it in there? You know what I mean? So that the DRB has something to fall back on as this, this was the intent of the regulation. And um, so you've got to give a good reason why you're going over it. I mean, I think the intent that we have in our parking standards already may cover that. Okay. So I don't know that we need to have a new, an additional intent, um, okay. but we could potentially add to this to say something like to reduce impervious cover or you know provide additional green space or something along those lines as necessary. But I, I don't know that we need to add more language under the intent on okay. why we would need to do that. Fair enough. Eric, if it were to fall under a conditional use review, what is what is the standard that they use for that? Yeah, I was actually just thinking about that. So, uh, let's see. Under conditional use, um, it would be the character of the area affected, um, the bylaws in effect, the utilization of renewable energy sources resources, um, capacity of of community services and facilities. And then there's specific performance standards uh, related to section 413, which gets into, I believe, the noise. Um, I'm sorry, I think that's the wrong ref. Yeah, 413, which gets into like noise and vibration and odor and things of that nature. So it may be that some of those could work, but we would maybe you, maybe we would use those standards to create an additional standard for parking specific review. So it's not really a conditional use review, but it is a review with a specific standard included. So um, I'll, look at, I'll look and see what other communities are doing to get a sense as well of how they're reviewing if, they're, if they do allow for uh, a project to go over the, the maximum. Because I know Burlington's not the only one that has maximum parking limitations. So um, it may be that we write our own standard for that. So Eric, quick question. You just referenced section 4.13. Did I hear you right? Yes. There is no there is no four point one three, is there? There is. You just you just don't have it with this document. Okay. <laughs> of course there is. One. <laughs> I didn't want you to get I didn't want you to get too far ahead of things. <laughs> okay. okay. All but, right. Well thank you for that discussion on that. That's good. Okay. So looking at the table, um, some changes that that were made since our last meeting. Um, let me just get my other sheet from last meeting. So assisted living, uh, we changed that to one spaces per three bed or 1.0 spaces per three beds. Um, under theater and entertainment, we included the language of the, uh, the square footage com component if no seats existed. Uh, under healthcare facility, we did patient bed or room, just in case there's uh, one or the other. And then we had a discussion about the school parking. And so I did reach out, I didn't reach out to the school directly, but I did reach out to the architect who designed the school, um, just because I thought he might have some more input on both our school and other schools in general. And he, he actually did have quite a, quite a bit of, of really good information on this. So what he recommend, well, I shouldn't say he recommended it, but what we talked about were, was, uh, so one of the things that we talked about, uh, sorry, trying to find my other notes, is that, and I didn't realize this, but with the primary schools, there's often time, while, there's, while it's children um, that aren't driving, there's often potentially three or four adults that are in the room as well for the instructional space. So, 
Um, when you get into like the first through fifth grade, you're looking at you know oftentimes two or three adults in the room, and then when you get into the high school and middle school, it's usually just one teacher per classroom at that point. So, but then there's also other staff and uh, whatnot going on. So what he suggested was that a number for a, for primary and secondary schools maybe closer to, to like a three to four spaces per per classroom or per um, instructional space, as he called it. So, and then what he also mentioned was that something for higher education may be closer in line with the six spaces per instructional space. So what I was thinking is we may, uh, and looking at what the school has currently and what they proposed, um, their, so the previous school before the redevelopment, I believe had around 200 to 225 spaces on site. They were proposing uh, 275 spaces with the redevelopment. So that would be, so at three spaces, sorry, they have 86 instructional uh, spaces in the, in the new school total. So at three spaces per instructional, three parking spaces per instructional space, that would, that would come out to 258 spaces. If we did three and a half, that would be 301 spaces. If we did four, that would be 344 parking spaces. So I was thinking somewhere in the, I was thinking at three spaces, three parking spaces per classroom for primary and secondary, putting those on the same line. And then um, changing the, the line of secondary school to higher education at six spaces per, per classroom. Did, did he have any insight on why that goes up? I think because you got more people driving. Ah, okay. Totally makes sense. Yep. Right. Yeah, and I would think that for secondary school, you've also got like seniors that might be driving. Right, exactly. Which so as you're ramping down the number of teachers and instructional uh, aides in the classroom, you are kind of increasing the number of, of students that are driving. Um, I don't know what our current enrollment is at the high school of, of, of students that are of driving age and how many of them actually drive. But right. my guess is a majority of them are still walking if they, uh, if they are able to drive. Um, but I, I have no, yeah. no real insight on that. that. That was where kind of where my mind went was I was thinking by high school you should have fewer paraeducators, but definitely more people driving. That right, makes sense. exactly. So I was yeah. thinking we change that we, we make it primary and secondary schools at three spaces per classroom and then higher education at six spaces per classroom. Because we do have CCV, so it, we do have higher education here in the city. But um, the three spaces per classroom, at least given Winooski's uh, new project, lands us kind of right around where they are with the number of spaces that they have. And this is probably going to have more implications for private education facilities because, I mean, we've already, I mean, the, the public school was granted its zoning variance, so, like, right. they're fine, but if this is really going to... And I assume that they're staffed less than the public school. I mean, that's an assumption on my part, but so this is probably a pretty generous standard. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's kind of my question because I'm thinking, you know, we do have St. Francis that's what, I don't know if they have kindergarten, but one through eight anyway. Don't, and we, also, kindergarten. don't we also have Center Point School? Center Point yeah. as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, and there's one on, um, what is it, East Allen? Isn't there there? Is, yeah, there is. There's a school back in the Hillside Industrial Park as well. The Belvedere School, I think, or a, a mm -hmm. branch of the Belvedere School. I'm not sure if that's still what they're called. Yeah. I thought it was called the Mill School. That, that so might be what it is. They'd have to take down those buildings and rebuild the buildings, and that's when they were, right now they have what they have, right? Right. right. So would they be... Would it apply to existing structures now, or would they essentially? Yeah. This would only apply for new development. So anything that currently exists is fine. Um, this is this would only apply to new development. So what what if they were altering an existing? If they yeah. were adding any any new square footage that would require a zoning permit, we would look at their standard of review. And I believe actually there is language. I added language to that effect. Uh, further down okay. in this section. So like say like the mill school adds, you know, four classrooms on a wing or something, would they have to now revisit this standard? Yes. Okay. And are you going to keep it classroom or, or 
What was the other term the, the architect used? Uh, instructional the space. I, I don't. I'm. I don't really have a, a preference one way or another. I think it's really more. A classroom makes sense to me, just because that's what I've always referenced. <laughs> what if they didn't? What if they wanted to say? put the wing on, as Joe's saying, but they didn't want to increase their parking or didn't feel they needed to, would they be required to? Well, if, they, if they did not meet the minimum parking standards, then yes, they would need to, they would need to increase the parking. Okay. Did they seek a variance through the DRB? Not currently. Okay. No. We have no mechanism in place to, to reduce the number of the, we have no mechanism in place currently to reduce the parking standards beyond what's included in here for uh, adjustments. So they could take advantage of the adjustments that are outlined in here, but we have no mechanism to just waive minimum parking. So the the Winooski Capital um, project at the, the school system, it, that's an instance of where the variance was sought to actually exceed the minimum? That was more of a case because we didn't have a standard. Okay. Uh, at that, when they came in for their application, we didn't have a standard. So the standard I was looking at would have been for office. So they would have had to do four spaces per thousand square feet, which would have been like, I think five or 600 parking spaces, which they okay. definitely did not need. So that's, that's why the, the language for the, for the waiver um, was, that's part of the reason why the language for the waiver was developed, which they did take advantage of uh, when it was available. So um, it was more than what they had, but less than what they would have been required under that interpretation. Correct. Okay. Okay. Just so I'm understanding yeah. that correctly. Yes. And so would it apply, following up on Joe's question, would it apply only to an addition? Um, would these requirements apply only to an addition, uh, the square footage for the addition, or would it then apply to the whole building? It would, I believe it would apply to the whole building. We would look at it as an entire site. Okay. As, they're, as they're changing the site, we would look at the entire site to make sure it was compliant. Okay. Um, no, go ahead, Abby. I have a question. Um, since our Winnie School is K through 12, when you talked about 85 classrooms or educational spaces, did you break, it, break out which were for the high school and which for the, were for the elementary school? I did not, no. That, was, uh, that came straight from the architect, um, that he just gave me the number of, of 86 instructional spaces. Because I wonder if the numbers wouldn't work out if we did have that breakout based on the 1.5, because he's saying go up with your primary and down with your secondary. Um, but I wonder if we broke out the spaces, how they're currently attributed to the grades, that we wouldn't end up, you know, it'd be, It'd be helpful to know that because we took this standard directly from Burlington and it doesn't seem like Burlington is the place to overbuild parking for their schools. Um, so I just would be hesitant to kind of make our own standard without sort of grounding it a little bit more. Sure. I mean, well, I can definitely follow up to see if he can give me a break out of that. I mean, I think, though, if we're combining the primary and secondary into the same line or making it the same standard of parking, it I think I if I'm thinking about it correctly, would kind of just, it would be a wash, um, depending on, it wouldn't matter if it was primary or secondary because it's the same standard, but I, I might not be thinking about that correctly. I just don't know, like, it's probably not 50% of the classroom for high school and 50% are the K-3. It probably is not divided by, by that, but I'm not sure. Um, if it is divided like that, then maybe it would come out the same. I don't know, it's hard to really understand it without that breakdown. And then like JFK, or no, I shouldn't say JFK, but the Winooski School District is unique because it's a K-12 campus, but the other schools in Winooski are not. So is there value in keeping those separated? Uh, I mean, I think that's a good question. I'm. I I guess I don't know enough about schools and, and what, the, what the actual, um, who's all in the classrooms and, and how many teacher's aides and, and other staff they, they have. So I'm not entirely sure um, if, I, I guess I don't know if there's a good consistent standard that would apply to all of our schools that would, yeah, I'm just not, I'm not sure if there's a good consistent standard. So, uh, Connor, I see you have your hand raised. Oh, I mean, this is like related, and I apologize if I missed this earlier, but like, is there a, 
is there a like a definition of what the instructional space is? Because like my first thought was, are we talking about I don't know band rooms or like labs as well that aren't commonly used? So. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. So in, in my conversations with the architect, he did, in, he did indicate that the instructional spaces um, are not necessarily just traditional classrooms. So it could be um, some sort of art studio or band room or something like that that they're calling instructional spaces. Yeah. Which may be why they're using the term instructional space because it's, it's more, more just generic yeah. than a classroom. Yeah. That, it does seem like you, you sought out the best possible information from the architect on that because I'm sure that they put a great deal of thought into it. Um, I, I, I think I may have raised this question at a previous meeting. Um, I think we were kind of talking about new new construction versus um, pre-existing, but like uh, St. Francis Xavier School, like a few years ago, they didn't rebuild the school, but they redesigned their parking. And right. I can't remember what we discussed if they... Did they have to um, visit that office standard when they redesigned that? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that was happening right as I was starting. So uh, I don't believe they did have to, to revisit it because they weren't adding new space. They were, they were just kind of reconfiguring their existing parking. And, and I think they were um, maybe added some additional parking. Oh. Um, but I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure of the, the details on that. I know they were doing a lot of interior renovation. Right. But... Because I thought the actual, I mean, they, it might have been the actual paved surface decreased, um, which was, they did a beautiful job doing it. I'm just kind of wondering what process they went through to... Um, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, that was, like I said, I think that was before, that, was, that had already been approved before I was on staff. So, Eric, going back to the, the, the classroom versus instructional space, it seems like instructional instructional space makes more sense and needs to be defined to include classrooms and band room, you know, wherever instruction is taking place. Yep, I can uh, I can make that change and add that new yeah. new language. So the so the other thing, this is different. <laughs> I'm just gonna bring it up because it crossed my mind. But so. In the school, cases of the school, can parking be classified under flexible parking? In other words, we have some situations where shared parking can happen. Did the schools fall under that? So in other words, can people use the parking in the evenings when the school is not in session? They, um, technically they could uh, if there was an agreement with, with the school and whoever was looking to use it. Because that's private property, the school would have to authorize the use of that, those parking spaces after hours. Yeah, but does any, could anybody, you're going to, um, might need a refresher on how we, how this actually works in the city, but, so there's some situations where people are developing properties and they're, they're using other people's property to park on in exchange for different times of the day or some flexible schedules, right? So um, actually we'll get into that here um, just below okay. in our parking adjustments. That is an option. Parking um, adjustments, so, yeah, okay. So I just wondered if the school would fall, these schools would fall under that too. It um, could. A perfect one for that, isn't it? Yeah, I mean it could. If there was adjacent uses that needed parking, yeah. they, could, yeah. they could work with the school to utilize their parking in those off hours. And that, okay. that's actually a good point, Sarah, because that the Hogaboom parcel there, which is a relatively large undeveloped track, is very close to the the school parking. Um, so, I mean, are they at at will to use the parking during the evening? Right. Um, also, just the, the thought crosses my mind um, if we're talking about what the public school was able to use as far as the variance that they were granted. Does that kind of de facto make it best practices for any other private organization because I know there's some subjectivity there but wouldn't it be like you know kind of if this is the standard that's applied to the Winooski school district you know if you're center point school could you say hey this is what they did yeah that's a good question um, I think if, I'm, if I remember correctly the 
with the, the waiver process that the school went through, they had identified a number of spaces that they needed uh, and could accommodate on site. And I think they just brought that number forward because there was no standard at the time to review against a school. And I think that is what they used as the, the basis of review for getting, getting that waiver to the parking standards. So that would not be available currently for anybody else, because again, because the waiver doesn't exist anymore. So that's where we would look to add in some, some minimum standards for parking for those uses. Okay. Since it didn't exist at the time. Which is theoretically what we're going on is based on what they use to calculate. Sure, their... yes, that's correct. That's correct. Okay. So Eric, what, what you're suggesting, if I heard you correctly, is um, for, under schools, you'll make schools primary and secondary, three spaces per institutional space or whatever the heck we call it. And then you'll have school higher education, and that'll be six spaces per instructional space? That would be my proposal with the caveat of going back to, to determine if there, what the breakdown is in instructional spaces at the Winooski School Complex so that we can get a better sense of how many are dedicated to the, I'll say the primary school versus the secondary school and see what those numbers look like. Now, I, I thought I heard you say that the architect said that um, it really is a wash because there are more instructional aids in the primary schools and and more staff maybe in the secondary Did I hear that right? generally that's what he said yes yeah, that as you go from the primary school to the secondary school you're shifting the number of aids in the classroom but you're adding in kind of some of the other um, administrative staff not that the administrative staff is only serving the the, the secondary school but the you can account for those those that parking need within the, the within that component. Okay. So you're gonna you're gonna contact the school? I'm gonna contact the architect. Architect, okay. To find out what the what the breakdown is of instructional spaces for primary versus secondary. If, if there is a breakdown. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure they have something. Okay. So in this instance right. we're actually going I'm up from there. what the we're we're increasing the we're kind of blending it. Okay. For primary and secondary. Okay. Sorry, Abby. I was just saying, if you can't get um, answers um, from the architect about the school, the buildings, I'm happy to, I'm there all the time. I'm happy to pop in and talk to an administrator and see if that's something that's readily available. Yeah. Um, my experience with the school is that there are there's a primary teacher and there's at least one aide in the rooms with the kids, um, but those are only assigned based on the need of the, like a specific child in, in the room. And then the secondary is so much higher because of the number of high schoolers that are driving to school. Um, that's my understanding of why there's, there's such a spread there. Um, so yeah, it'd be good to just like ground it maybe with somebody else. And, and check the numbers in the school to make sure it makes sense. Yep. Yep, I can follow up on that and bring something, bring some more information back to the next meeting. And, okay, I'm sorry. I'm still trying to understand them. So if you were to take this formula or the one that you're going to re-go to and there was a school in town that didn't say have high school, does that affect that? I mean... Nope. It would be it would be, it would, we'd, it would be work out. primary and secondary would all be the same number. So okay. if it's only okay. primary school, they'd be they would still fall under that same standard. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Where but if we like under the way it is currently, if it was just an elementary school, they would have to build only one point five or what Eric's proposing is they would have to build three. Correct. So you'd have to build if it's just a primary school, they would have to build more spaces than what's proposed currently. And then if it's just a secondary school, they would have to build less spaces than what's proposed. So there is some implications of combining them if we think we'll have schools that aren't K through 12. Right. Right, but the guidance, or at least the information that I got was that generally those primary school classrooms have more aides or other teachers' aides or other instructors that are, are helping out. 
Um, he basically said that at the pre-K level, um, there's usually four or five adults in a classroom of 15 to 20 kids is the information that he gave to me. So, um, okay. which I think that's kind of what they design for in some of their work. Um, I, I, I don't have any basis to, to refute that or to, to come up with a different number, but that's, I'm just going off of what he's told me. I'm only wondering if that's excessive because, again, being a public school system, there's a lot of different needs being accommodated, whereas, like, say, like, a smaller, more intimate educational setting that maybe wanted to open up in Winooski, like, this might be a little bit restrictive. Um, I don't, that's just the thought that crosses. But I'm also, like I just mentioned earlier, I'm kind of wondering... You know, if this is the standard that the Winooski School District follows, shouldn't the others have to follow that as well? So. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, some more research to come. So, Eric, your, your last comment about uh, pre-K um, brought me down to daycare facility. And mo I, I think most daycare facilities are basically pre-K although they weren't around when I was a kid. Um, but I wonder if one space per 500 square feet for a daycare is adequate. I don't know the answer, I just, because yeah. I, I know where, where my son said my granddaughters, there seems to be quite a bit of staff to, to handle the kids. Does anyone know if there's, um, what's a, legal requirements are on number of adults per children, if any, exist for safety reasons? Uh, it's, um, if they're under two, you can only have, I think it's four, three or four per adult, and then over two, I think it's five per adult. Okay. Um, so my experience is that they don't often exceed the minimum requirements because it's costly. Yeah, very costly. So on daycare, would it make sense to, to relate the spaces to number of children as opposed to the square footage of the building? So with our definition of daycare, we include uh, care for children, the elderly, or individuals with disabilities and protective, in, in a protective setting for a portion of a 24-hour day including state registered or licensed child care providers serving more than six full-time and four part-time children. So it's not, we're not, so our definition of daycare facility does not include only children. Yeah, this, this is what's a little confusing because I thought that would be under assisted living before we were, it's, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And how is that done statewide? Is there must be people is this ridiculous to say like maybe there should actually be an asterisk on like those two like to see the definition because like I think I don't know if I was like a developer proposing an elder care facility I wouldn't necessarily think of looking for a daycare facility under I, I don't know so for assisted living we define that as a state licensed facility that provides rooms meals and personal care service in living arrangements designed to meet the needs of people who cannot live independently and usually do not require the type of care provided in a nursing home. That's okay. how we define assisted living. Okay. No, no problem with the definition. I'm just saying, like, <laughs> where, like, it, just how how people might think of this and and looking at the standards. I guess. Uh... So they're going to ask Eric, where do I fall if I'm putting in an adult daycare? And Eric will say, under daycare. Right. Uh, yeah. Depending on what you're doing there, yes. If it's just you're just taking care of some folks for part of the day, um, they're not living there. You're not providing meals necessarily um, or other care to them. Then, yeah, I'd say you're under a daycare facility. I, I guess I'm thinking of like, say, I'm Cathedral Square and I'm pursuing, you know, a complex in Winooski. I wouldn't have immediately thought to look under daycare facility. Like, yeah. right. Which I think would probably fall more under the assisted living category okay <laughs> potential so what what is our what is our lady of providence care facility on uh, west spring currently fall under would we... i would classify them as an assisted living facility yeah. okay personally 
Okay, so I will do some more research on some of these numbers as well, um, just in the interest of time and, and, yes. and moving past uh, just the minimums. I, I did want to bring up um, retail sales because okay. it had been uh, three spaces per thousand and now it's one per thousand. Um, restaurant, we, we cut down to one per 500 or two per thousand. And I'm just wondering, I don't recall, I, I, I thought we were going to do retail sales the same as restaurant, but maybe I, what's the term, mis, misunderstood? I don't and have any... My, my, concern, my concern is really gets back to a retail use, the first level commercial can use on-street parking to offset some of the required parking. But I am always concerned about the fact that I'm not sure that that there's really anything that we've ever discussed or in zoning that talks about inventorying the on-street parking capacity. And if you know, if you've got ten retail or, or first level commercial um, spaces, and you give them um, reduction in the on-site requirement for parking because you you say you can use five street park spaces well are we over um over using those over subscribing those street spaces yeah well um mike you're in luck because i do have language that's proposed under the public parking section of parking reductions to address just okay. that issue all right I mean, so. I should have read further down. <laughs> <laughs> it's in section 4.13. Oh, I did want to just mention there is somebody in the audience in case we wanted to ask if there were any comments. Mm -hmm. Oh, someone other than Michael? Oh, yes. Uh, Michael has left us and Daisy Berbeco has joined us. So, um, Daisy, if there's anything you want to comment on at any time, please feel free to use the raise hand feature or the chat function and we can uh, recognize you. And I was looking up right before we move on to the next section, um, sort of, I just like to see what other jurisdictions are doing again to kind of ground some of the stuff. And, um, I looked at Concord, New Hampshire, and they have, just as comparison, they have for their primary school, which is their elementary and middle, two spaces per classroom. Their high school is seven spaces per classroom, and their post-secondary school and colleges are 15 per classroom um, if it's non-residential and only five if there's residential, like if there's dorms on campus. So. Again, there is a spread, there is like um, that spread that's similar to, to what Burlington has exists in other places. Um, so I'm just, I'm just gonna throw that out there, that combining them is not something, just like quickly looking through is something I see. So between now and the next meeting, they'll give us more time to dig into that, but I, hey, I'm just Abby, can, that out. Can I yeah. ask you, you said you're up at the school a lot. Yeah. Do you, I'm assuming you know Sean, uh, yeah. Can you, you want to pop in and just ask him? Again. Say, Sean, what are your thoughts? I think he would fall over if I said that the architect um, said there are four to five adults in, a, in each of these classrooms. Um, well, I I think, think. I, I, yeah, I wouldn't even go there. I'd just say, Sean, we're, we're dealing with parking. We're just trying to get a feel for what, you know, from your experience, what kind of numbers you need for primary and secondary schools? Yeah, I'm, ha I'm happy to have that conversation. Yeah. Okay. I'll take one more thing off Eric's plate. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we can also leave these as they are. I mean, we don't have to, to change anything here if we don't want to. Um, yeah. So just, I'll also throw that out. So these are, sure. that's why these are all draft. Yeah. Yep. So, so let's, Eric, if you do a little bit more with the uh, architect and Abby gets some input from, from Sean up at the school or whoever, and we can revisit it. And I, I, I'm just, I, just to reiterate, I, I think we know that like 
the Winooski School District is kind of taken care of in this regard. We're kind of thinking about, I don't know, my, from my perspective, this would be going forward for other potential new educational facilities come in, coming into Winooski. Sure, and I think it's also important to remember that these are just the minimums that we're proposing. So this would be the minimum number of spaces that are needed. People can, as we've talked, we have no maximum, so they can add as much as they want within the, the limitations of the rest of our regulations. But um, these, this is what the, this is the minimum that we would require that they do. And that's why I'm kind of wondering if the minimums are onerous if we're basing them towards a public education system versus a smaller facility. Yep, absolutely. That, that's, and that's a good point. So. So Joe, I'm gonna, I'll reach out to Robin McCormick at St. Francis, get her input too. Okay. Yeah, because I thought, I actually thought theirs went down, that they, they proposed a smaller lot than what they'd had. Because they, they wanted they wanted more like um, green space and like they were expanding like the playground facilities and so forth. Yeah. Anyway, I think it would be good to also take that into account. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So moving on, the next section here, I believe. I believe the language that's stricken under item two here has been moved. I don't believe this is a get rid of because it's in green. I'm not exactly sure. I think it was, some of it was rolled into part D here under the parking adjustments. Uh, yeah, so some of it was rolled into part D. Some of it I believe was removed for clarification, but really this section under part D is where we get into some of these adjustments that we've been talking about and um, how to reduce the, the number of parking, the minimum number of parking that's required currently. So not much new changing here under D. One thing that has come up, um, I was contacted by one of the uh, property owners and developers in town about the shared use and uh, questioning if, if the, 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 the square footage number here was too high, if there'd be a, um, any interest in potentially considering a reduction in the amount of non-residential square footage that could be shared. And I don't disagree. That's something I've been thinking about as well. I think 10,000 square feet of non-residential space is a, is a fairly high number for what we've seen for developments. And I guess just to give you a sense of some of the gateway developments that have been built recently, um, the 348 Main Street, uh, Junior's Faux Dang, I believe they've got about 6,400 square feet of non-residential on their first floor. Um, 355 Main Street at the corner of Bellevue and Main, they've got about 1,200 square feet of non-residential on their first floor. Uh, 211 Main, where the Fusion Cafe and, and Wicked Wings, that's about that's just over 5,000 square feet of non-residential space on that first floor. Um, the 10 Manso Street, where Sarum's Cafe is, that's about 1,500, suite, uh, 1500 square feet of non-residential space on that first floor. So. I mean, we are seeing non-residential non space. We're just seeing smaller amounts. So I don't know if, if uh, what your all's opinion is on, on the 10,000 number. Um, it seems high to me if we're looking at creating areas of shared use where we're looking at a non-residential use sharing with a residential use or even the non-residential uses sharing among themselves, um, which I believe is how this is currently written. Well. I, you just referenced a property that I think I've asked this a number of times, but you're just saying that you hadn't seen an instance where a developer had built parking beyond what the minimum was required, right? Correct. So the the building that Juniors is in on Upper Main Street, I forget the address number. 350, uh, 348. The, the parcel just south of it that they had acquired that is a, just a parking lot. There, so yes, so there was an agreement in place to be able to use that in, for, on a temporary basis for parking. Um, there is actually a development proposal to, to redevelop that property. Okay. So they, I believe, I think 348 has all the parking they need on site. Right. I think there was just an interest in, in having some potential overflow there if they needed it. Because so, yeah, that's what I wasn't understanding because there's nothing else on that parcel. Correct. Already. That's correct. But there is a there there's there's one outstanding condition on the issuance of the permit for redevelopment on that site. Okay, so that might 
I guess could be an instance of where a developer builds in more parking, but that was really just more of a placeholder for a future development. Correct. Yep. So yeah. what, if, what if that, what if they had bought that property and just left it that way? Are we good that way? I mean, the juniors building owners, are we good with that? In other words, should that be tied to the, to the buildings, the parking? In other words, can you just buy a lot and make a big parking space? Not, yeah. not if it's its own lot. They would have to combine the two lots. Right. That, so that's what I wasn't understanding. I guess right. Why. So those, but those lots have been merged then? They have not, um, which is why they're... So there was an agreement in place, um, again, like I said, to be able to use that for, for parking on a, on a temporary basis. Uh, I forget exactly the, the mechanism of that. Again, that was something that happened right as I had just started. Yep. Um, but there has since been a development proposal that has been approved with one outstanding condition to redevelop that site uh, at what's addressed as 340 Main Street. Okay. Um, when that gets developed, whatever parking is associated with the, that development um, will accommodate what the, the needs for that project. And 348 Main Street, I believe, has all the parking they need on site currently to accommodate their development. I guess that's what I didn't understand because if, so 340, the juniors building just north, yep. if they had adequate parking, why would they have built a separate parking structure just south of it? So they didn't actually build any structure there. Or, or it, it was basically just the lot that, so they, as I understand it, the lot was cleared and they used that as the staging area to build 348 Main Street. Okay. And so then that just remained as an empty space. Is it not parking now? They're, they're, they do park there, but it's not any type of improved parking area, as, as far as no, I'm aware. It's not paved? I don't believe it is, no. I think it's gravel. Okay. Which is why they also closed off the curb cut off of Main Street and put up the fence as part of the, um, uh, part of the requirements to be able to use that for parking. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, just curious what people's thoughts are on the, the 10,000 square foot minimum for non-residential to, to use shared parking. If there's any interest in, in reducing that number at all. I mean, based on what you said, part of me saying no, being a, a hard-nosed, uh, I'll use that term, and part of me saying, well, if no one's building over about 5,000 square feet, maybe cutting it in half, the, the 5,000, but... Yeah, the other thing I was thinking of, I was thinking something similar, Mike, but I was also thinking about maybe we do a tiered approach, or we could do a tiered approach. So, like, from 0 to 2,000 square feet, you get a certain percentage, and then from 2,000 to 5,000, you get another percentage, and then so on and so on, up to 10,000. Yeah. So that, yeah. so that for these projects that are building these smaller commercial spaces, they, they still can get the benefit of, of the shared parking because generally speaking, during the day, when for these residential uses, the vehicles are leaving during the day, so that frees up those spaces to yeah. potentially be used for, to meet the needs of any type of non-residential use that's there. So the examples yeah. you cited, nothing was even close to 10,000, right? Correct. Yeah, the, the largest one was uh, the uh, the juniors in Fodang, which I believe is, if I looked at the plans correctly, about 6,400. So was was the intent here when this was originally drafted that shared use would just be for these, like, really exceptional instances? I, that's. I think so. I'm not entirely sure what the what the thought process was for that for um, using that number, but I haven't I seen you anything. Know, election, Eric, when we talked about it way back when we were drafting this. It was looking at the whole lots being developed and, and having shared parking between adjacent properties going down. Because we also talked about limiting the number of, of driveways or curb cuts on the, on the main street or on right. the main drive. Are, are you saying, Mike, that it was just envisioned that there would be projects built with larger square footages of retail space? The, yes. and and more it was really we were looking at the full build out when we were doing this and so okay on a block you've got all these buildings and all this parking let's do shared allow shared parking between the, the properties 
So yeah, cool. and uh, well, as I interpret this, it's it, it's done on an individual site basis. So each site would have to have that 10,000 square foot. Yeah, and, and I think that's right. I think that was a number, when we're doing this, I think there was more feeling that first level would be commercial as opposed to there's such a strong market for residential now and, and mm -hmm. it's a pretty soft market for commercial. Things mm -hmm. have changed. Yeah, it did seem like there was some like bare minimum like of requirements for the commercial spaces, like the tiny um, the tiny little restaurant in the one off Mans Mansu and then there's like an office like there that they're not going above what the requirement is for um, non-residential space. And I wonder if part of this was trying to encourage them to use their first floor for non-residential. I know it is required based on where you are in the gateway, places like up on Manso where it wasn't were required on the first floor if this would have been an incentive for that large building to use more of their first floor for non-residential use. I well, so you're viewing this as an incentive, Abby, that this was like to, to get yeah. developers to build in more retail space. Okay, I, I kind of could, I, I couldn't see that, I guess. I, I feel like this is an incentive because it's like saying, hey, you can build less parking um, in this circumstance, right? You, like, we'll consider you the sharing of these spaces. And I don't know, like, classically, yes, like residents would leave during the day and then they would return in the evening, but we're also saying, hey, nobody's driving anymore, a bunch of people aren't you know, driving. And then we're also saying, hey, teleworking is real in here. You know, so are we, are we grounded in the same reality we were when this was proposed? Yeah, I mean that's that's a good point as well. I guess to to the to the point of uh, the incentive, and I, I do I, I I do believe Abby that you are correct that it was there was some incentive to to create these larger non residential spaces. With that said, you know, looking at um, the the juniors Fodang space and the the Wicked Wings Fusion Cafe spaces, their entire first floor is non residential, and they're not they're not getting close to the ten thousand. Um, so again, that's just an example. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think it's just a reality of the the size of the buildings that are being constructed and just what what available land is there to to put anything in. So I'm happy leaving it at 10,000 square feet. I just just wanted to um, just get some insight on from you all if that's still a realistic number or if we should reduce that sum to to be able to encourage more shared parking on sites. Um, I do have a quick clarifying question. So in these multi-use buildings where there's incentive to reduce the amount of, um, to increase more affordable units um, by allowing um, reductions in the parking, uh, how will that work with shared, shared uses? So if a commercial space is required to have so many spaces and then with shared there's an incentive, but on site because there's been incentives applied to the residential side of things, will that shake out as intended? That's a good question. Um, yeah, uh, I'm not sure. I lo I've looked at that in any in any detail to see how that might be impacted. I would guess that it would, just given the if they were able to utilize this shared use provision, just given the the percentage of parking that would be allowed to be shared. Yeah. But I that that's a good question. Because I'm just thinking about, yeah, I, I, and I don't have like the ability to put numbers to it, but I'm, you know, thinking about the desire of, you know, optimizing space and for both um, residential units and for commercial retail space. Mm -hmm. And we're encouraging shared use, but we're also at the same time agreeing to reduce parking minimums. I, like how, if that actually would um, really work out the way we needed to for the shared in incentive to work. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I'll see what I can do to, to put some, some yeah. numbers to that. And uh, in which case, perhaps yeah. tiering might be an option. Right, yeah. yeah. The other question I had, which, um, so how does shared you 
work. Does that mean that that deal that these properties make with each other is a perpetuity? I mean, how do you so get sold? I mean, so as I interpret this, Sarah, it's it's on one individual site is where the sharing occurs. It's not between sites. So okay, not between sites. So if that Correct. site that building sells and the access owner says, I don't want to share anymore, that's okay? Well, be, yeah, because it'd still be all on site. So they would have a, they would have a certain number of spaces that are, are serving both the non-residential space on the first floor and any um, residential space in the building. Okay. So it's, it's so, just, this is not like an easement on an adjoining parcel? That's right? correct. Okay. That's correct. Okay. That's actually, there is a, uh, um, there is a provision for off-site locations, okay. uh, which is further down, but this would not, as I interpret it, this is only for on-site, for, for the same site. All the, all the development needs to be on the, on the same site. Because I think we, we discussed that eons ago about uh, making sure yeah. that if there was shared parking on an off-site parcel, that that yep. was in fact going to be like a deed of record and yes. would be enforceable. Yep, absolutely. So uh, I'm okay. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Abby. Yeah. And the other thing that occurs to me throughout all of these conversations, because we use parking so much as like an incentive and like a, like a token um, throughout a lot of the changes we've made in the zoning. I'm always thinking about like how the developer can stack, can stack all these together to get to, you know, to get to um, a parking reduction that will have then consequences on the neighborhoods around it, which sort of is where this all this conversation started way back when. So I'm just thinking about like we're reducing the parking reductions in the table, and then we have parking reductions for the TDM, you know, incentives. We have the parking reductions potentially with shared use, and then with EV charging, and then with under, underground parking, right? So I'm like, I just want to make sure that we're thinking about how these all can be stacked on top of each other and what implications that could have for um, a property in the in the neighborhood surrounding it because i think um the last when we made some changes and the manso property happened that was like all we heard about for a long time and it really like i think sparked readdressing some of this stuff and i think we're making some really good moves on like right sizing things but i don't know if we're fully thinking about what what it looks like if incentives are stacked upon one another because there is definitely a, an incentive on the developer side to have less parking if they can be accommodating if their um, if their clientele could be accommodated in an existing street parking so I think it's just a balance but it's a balance and I bring that up to make sure that we are thinking about that yeah, and that's a really good point. And I think that also comes into play when we look at not just the minimum parking that we're requiring and all the incentives that we may be offering, but that starts to bleed into the management of, of, our, of our existing on-street facilities and, and where we're metering, where we're enforcing, where we're doing resident only, some of those other components that came out of that parking inventory analysis and management plan. So I think... I don't think it's it's exclusively just looking at minimum parking standards. I think it also is going to include looking at the management of our of our existing on street facilities, which is obviously not included in zoning, but is a part of the conversation. Yeah, yeah. I I do think what the, the point you raised though with the ten thousand square feet of non residential gross floor area, I mean, unless that is in fact going to be an incentive to get that built in, it does seem so far afield from what the average is that it's it's not functional i can i can see i see the value in the tiered approach there. yeah i was gonna say let me ask i was gonna just ask are folks comfortable if i draft some language that has a tiered approach to to this rather than just leaving it at the ten thousand square feet or you just want to leave it where it is well i hate to give you more work eric but no, it does I, make a certain amount of sense i mean i, 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 I did offer so <laughs> why, why don't you why don't you give us that eric okay and, and, and Abby, thank you for bringing up the, the impact of neighborhood because that's something I think about all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I think about the building that Wicked Wings is in um, yeah. and under the current, like I don't think they needed the shared use provision to work for them because it's pretty minimal. The, their parking in the back is pretty minimal, pretty small, tiny lot back there that's serving that building. So I don't think they would need, would have need 
needed to take advantage of this based on what they're already required to do and how little that is? I think they, actually, I think they have about 45 spaces back there for that property. Is there an underground? There's, there's not. They originally had proposed underground, but they decided to, to, to not go that route. But they, they, do, they do have quite a bit of parking in the back. Okay. I walked it the other day because I was looking at the EVs too. Like they have a fair amount of EV stations and it seemed like a pretty minimal amount of parking for the size of the building. So I don't know. Just it's always helpful to have like specific projects to kind of ground the stuff in. Yeah, I think just for reference, just for reference, that building has, it's got 27 residential units in it. So um, it's, it, it is a big building, but I don't think it's as, as big as it might seem for the number of spaces they have. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm going to jump in and give a time check. It's 7.57. Um, so just keep that in mind. Eric, how much longer do you think on this parking? <laughs> well, we've got... <laughs> <laughs> we did one page. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, <laughs> We've got about 10 more pages, so I mean, we can go all night long if you want, Mike. That's the way parking well, goes. Well, well, yeah, it, it, that's why that's the only thing we had on the agenda tonight. <laughs> right. Um, well, uh, so I'm wondering well, if it's a good Mike, time to break or... Eric? Well, no, Connor was about to say something. Oh, oh. no, I was just going to say, Mike just texted me and said that that was fine if we went all night, so... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> who who texted you? <laughs> Me? <laughs> no, I'm ready to go. Uh, I just wonder if this is a good break point or you want to go to something else. Um, I mean, I think this is probably a decent spot to break the next, the next, so we're into the parking adjustments. The next part would be yeah. our transportation demand management strategies. Yeah. yeah. So, and I think this is, I mean, it's going to be some, some good conversation, I think. So, because we are, while we already have the place for transportation demand management in here, this is definitely getting a, a pretty healthy update just to, to okay. get some better guardrails on what's required and what we're offering uh, for those reductions. So um, that might take some that might take some additional time. So it's probably good that we yeah. pause here or I, I'm okay if we want to pause here. Um, yeah. I, I think so because I, I don't think Bryn wants to be here much longer. <laughs> I mean, I was here till 1130 on Monday. I, we can make this an all nighter. <laughs> nah, that's, okay. that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> all right. So let's see. So we'll stop there on, on this section and I can go back to my agenda. I think city updates is probably next. Uh, I believe that is correct. Let me just make sure I've got my organization together. Yes, okay, so city updates. Um, I've got several, I have several updates for you all. I guess I would turn it over to Councilor Oakley first if there's any updates from uh, council to share? Sure. Um, I'd say the most important thing is that we are right in the very beginning of budget season. I know, although for staff, they've been working on it for a couple months now. Um, but council just had our first meeting um, to review the budget, a uh, high level uh, review of the budget um, on Monday. So we pretty much meet uh, almost weekly through the end of January, barring um, holidays. And I'd say as much as you can, just to uh, I encourage you to follow along with that and to email uh, myself and the other counselors any questions that you have. I know that the slide deck can be pretty dense and sometimes hard to follow. So certainly don't be shy about sending us information about what you think, like how you feel about things. Um, feedback is really important at this stage of the game. Um, as well as any questions. Uh, so it, it really, um, your input really will help move the direction that council ends up going with this. Uh, I think namely, the most important thing is uh, if the city ter um, keeps a level funding at this point, uh, it, the tax rate could increase 14, about just over 14%. Um, we propose some proposed cuts as well as a proposal to use uh, one-time bridge funding, essentially uh, ARPA funding, um, that would bring it from that 
just over 14% down to 5%. Um, and then there are some adjustments that could be made. Um, they would be significant cuts, and I think the community would feel it. So it's not, they're not easy decisions by any means. Um, and, and so in that regard, it would be really valuable to, to get your feedback. Um, the city has, and I think the slide deck kind of goes into it, but the, um, you know, there's good review over how the tax rates have progressed over the last 10 years or so, as well as how the tax rates have progressed from the city side of things um, to the school side of things, property um, education tax side of things. So it's nice to have that side-by-side -side comparison as well. Uh, I think there tends to be some confusion in the community as to how much the city has influence over all of the taxes. Um, so this, you know, we, city council only has control over the city taxes and not the school side of things. So, um, you know, attending school board meetings is helpful too, but, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm sure we, um, uh, you know, <laughs> yours is thrilled and thrilled about these meetings as I'm sure many others are. So. Um, any, any time that you can commit to looking into it and engaging early is beneficial. Um, and uh, there might be some other city updates uh, that, that will be covered, but I think that's pretty much the primary thing that I want to emphasize right now. It was on and the cover of say, our nice community newsletter. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. If you say um, that if we level fund, the taxes will go up 15%, but we can use the ARPA funds to make that only 5% for the, the next year? So cuts, budget cuts, as well as some bridge funding. Oh, budget cuts as well. Yeah. And um, how's the TIF um, expiration and future funding play into all this? Sure. Um, so that there's a slide in the slide deck from the council meeting on Monday. It's um, it comes one point of confusion is that it won't the file won't be saved as a dot PPT. It'll be saved as a dot PDF, which you know is no surprise to many of you. But if anybody's watching, I've already had some of that confusion of where's the slide deck. So um, there is a slide in there that talks about the TIF, what's already, um, what's allocated, what's left over, um, and it accounts for what council has approved um, for allocations. So it doesn't talk about other potential intended uses um, on that slide. Um, and I think the anticipation is um, the TIF should expire in um, FY25 and uh, any, any ARPA funds that would be applied um, for FY24, the gap would need to be filled um, by the TIF. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not sure if that answers your question. It does. Uh, yeah, thanks. So, so picking up on that, Bryn, do you know at this point um, roughly what kind of dollars we're talking about increase from the TIF to the municipal side of things? I'm not, I might not be understanding the question. So in, other, in other words, do you have an estimate or is there an estimate of how much more general fund revenue will be generated from the TIF revenue that's currently going to pay off the debt? You know what I'm saying? So I'm going to pass that over to I, Eric. I, I want to say it's around a million dollars or so, somewhere okay. in that neighborhood. Yeah. And right. I think of that, of that money, there's a about three fifty to four hundred thousand that's uncommitted right yeah. now that's think, still available. I think the number might be more like four thirty eight. Yeah, so it's somewhere those are ballparks, but it's something yeah. in that general range. Yeah. So it's not a significant figure or um, it is not insignificant, but it's not as large as one might think. Correct. Correct. Okay. Correct. Do, do you know today does a does a penny still generate like forty eight thousand dollars and and um is that right? A penny, I think it was a penny was twenty forty eight thousand dollars in, in um, tax revenue. The what? You know what I mean? A, a like penny, one on, the penny on the tax rate. The tax base uh, would raise so okay. much. That okay. sounds that sounds about right. Um, again, I think you know Angela helped develop the, the yeah. slide deck, so she's pretty thorough. I, I would say it's probably in there. And while we're chatting, I could I actually might have it up and, and can cross reference that. <laughs> Um, that, that's about what it was when I was on the council, what, seven, ten years ago, so. Yeah, and I'll try and drop the link in the chat um, once we move to uh, city updates. Okay. Um, and 
also in the slide deck has right at the very beginning has the calendar of when we're reviewing each next um, section of the budget. So that that's a good reference point as well. And um, Brian, that survey that went out that asked the community how to spend the ARPA funds, was anything compiled, reported back? Was funding diverted towards what the public had asked for? Or what, what, what happened with that? Great question. Um, and so the survey is still open um, and the counselors have been um, doing um, basically some listening sessions and going out uh, to community groups to meet with them during the day at their like convenient location at their convenient time. Um, so we're progressing through through that and basically compiling feedback um, as as those meetings occur. I would anticipate because there's no urgency. So the way the council and city staff have been referring to ARPA funds is essentially is like the money formally known as <laughs> ARPA. Um, because we were able to essentially apply that money to the general fund. Now we, uh, I guess this past year, now that money is uh, un more for the most part unrestricted is from what I understand. It's still one-time funds, but we don't um, have the same, um, it's essentially uh, available general fund money. So the ARPA, mm -hmm. ARPA money we got was applied to the general fund that um, overages, for lack of a better <laughs> word, is now um, av other available one-time funding. So it could just be spent to like um, help with the tax bill, the resident tax bill, and that could be the end of it. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Initially, uh, initially the ARPA funds had all these specific requirements of how they could be spent and and all these these programmatic requirements, and then eventually, over time, I think the the, the federal government just kind of said, and I don't know if it's just for communities our size or smaller communities, they basically just said, here's some money, do it, do with it what you need to do with it. So. We technically, if we wanted to, could just put it all in the general fund and use it as uh, for for paving or for sidewalks or whatever, whatever we we want to do. Um, but yeah, so it's basically unrestricted funds at this point. To, that's a very oversimplification of it, but that's generally the. Just trying to break it down. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. Hey. Um, so I did drop the link for this uh, slide deck into the chat um, for quick, quick reference. And that's for anybody's. I don't know if this is the recording to be posted or is live. Yes, it'll be. It, okay, it's both so, live and it'll be posted. Okay. Yeah. Then um, the link is on the city council agenda from uh, December. Okay. From 5th? Monday night. Yeah, December fifth. And that's oh. what I have for now. So is it the right. budgeting process that yeah. took you to 11:30? No, we um, we also had negotiations about Lot 7D. Ah, yes. 7D is it's back. <laughs> so for anybody that's in, interested in that, um, it's the project is continuing to progress moving forward, and I imagine Eric will get into it as much as you can. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would just say, um, yeah, it's still moving forward. Um, there's, it's, it's slow but it is it is still moving forward i haven't been too involved in the discussions just because i'll be the um permitting entity on it so i've been kind of been kept at an arm's length on purpose but um but yeah it is still there is still a a proposal moving forward 7d is the fur furthest eastern parcel right the the dirt lot behind ccv yep that's currently being yeah. used for parking okay yep. yep so um oh sorry did you have any more okay so updates from my end. Uh, earlier today, a uh, some some information went out to our to the business community about some proposed changes to our sidewalk use um, regulations in the city. Uh, currently, we allow for businesses to request use of the sidewalks. Any business in the city can do this. Request use of, of the city sidewalk space um, for for seasonal activities. Um, mostly, it's been happening down in in the circle. Uh, but there are other businesses throughout the city that use those. So we've, we've been having some staff has internally been having some discussions and some concerns about how that space is used and just getting a little bit better handle on the administration and 
um, review of those applications as they get more complicated and, and people are looking for more space and wanting to push the boundaries a bit. So uh, we have drafted some new information, provided that out to the business community so that they have a sense of what's coming. That will be on a future council agenda um, after the budgets for sure. So probably not till later in January at the earliest, uh, we'll, we'll start in on those discussions. But just to give you a- Eric, is the, is the boardwalk considered sidewalk? down there it technically the is yeah where waterworks is they that's technically considered well it, i don't know if it's considered sidewalk but that is under our sidewalk use application so I hope the city is making a good amount of money on that because so they, that is one of the other things we're looking at is uh so there's a so for example uh waterworks and also mckees are they've got a kind of a different scenario because it's not really sidewalk per se as much as it's city property so we're looking at, at what we should do as far as some sort of licensing agreement or leasing agreement for, for, for in instances like that. So I, mean, I think they're both both great spaces. I'm glad they're being used. Yeah, that absolutely. But, they're, but I they're, hope the city's making money on it. That's all. Yep. Yep. We're making money on all of them. So um, <laughs> not a lot of money, but we are we are we do charge we a fee, more? I should say. <laughs> I should say we do we charge make a, more on it? We do charge a fee for use of the sidewalk. So it's yeah. it's not free for the business. The waterworks basically has a second uh, Restaurant out there. Really. Yeah. 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 Um, anyway. Another item to update you all on is you may remember the the um, proposed development at Main and Mansion um, for the the old mansion house and then the the property next to it. Um, November nineteenth, their permit expired, so they there's no longer a development proposal that has a valid permit for that project. So anything they want to do on that site, they have to come back through the whole process. They have to start the application process over uh, and, and comply with our current regulations that are in place. Um, it, you may recall we did make some changes to the form-based code uh, recently that do impact that project. So the, the, um, it would probably have to go through a complete redesign for any type of future development. Um, Who is the developer for that one? Uh, the owner was uh, Jeff Mungin. Okay. So did he sell it? He was, I believe, he was trying to. I don't believe that he did, but I think he was trying to sell it as a, uh, basically, as a permitted project. Oh. Um, but but wasn't, but wasn't there a, like a partnership agreement with another developer that would take over the? He would still be owner, but there would be another firm developing the parcel. That I don't know. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure what the logistics of it were uh, as far as the agreements in place, but I do know that there were, there were other folks that were, I believe, trying to purchase it. I don't know what the terms of the, that sale would have been. Is there any movement on the, um, it was called like the, the Wagoner block that was east of CCV. It was, yep. that, that went dormant and then it kind of Yep, similar situation. That's also, uh, they had a permit back, I think, in 2016, they were issued a permit, but that has long since expired as well. So there's been no new application on that project. It's odd, though, because it's been re-offered, though, like, and there's yep, architect's there's, renderings, but there's actually no permit in place. Correct. There's concepts out there on the websites or on websites if you, you can find them. And actually, I believe Abby and Sarah both uh, shared some of those concepts, uh, but... <laughs> There, there is no permit, there is no project uh, that is, is, is able to be built on that site at this time. Uh, the other item I wanted to update you all on, and this alludes back to what Mike had mentioned about the design review standards and why the interest in, in now keeping the language in place. Um, we did receive a, an application for demolition of the St. Stephen's Church that has come in. There is still an outstanding item that needs to be included with that application um, before we can com consider it a complete application and conduct our review. Because it's only an application for demolition, it will fall under those standards of design review. So it will get issued a zoning permit. Presuming everything is in place, it will get issued a zoning permit, which carries all the same standards as any other zoning permit does. So the property will be posted, there will be a 15-day appeal period uh, before any permit will be issued on that site. And then because it's demolition, there's other standards that they need to follow with, um, I believe it's with the EPA and the state um, office of whatever, I don't, I don't remember what state environmental office it is, but related to air quality and, and kind of a time frame for when any action can occur on that property. So um, still more to come on that, but they will, like I said, they will get issued a zoning permit, or sorry, 
presuming everything is complete and they provide the rest of the documentation, a zoning permit would be issued, property posted, rights to appeal to the Development Review Board like any other zoning permit is. Um, but, like I said, we still need the um, still need the environmental report on that. I did reach out to the State in, uh, Division of Historic Preservation because while that building is not listed, it is referenced in the survey for the rectory building. Um, and the State basically said that that's not enough of a connection to consider it historic. The property owner could request a, determina a determination of eligibility in which case that would put in some other standards. If it is determined to be eligible, it would kick in some other provisions of our regulations that would require a qualified historic preservation consultant to make a determination that the building is no longer contributing or eligible for listing. If they did not make that finding, if they said it is still eligible, then we would not be able to issue a zoning permit. So, or, or a demolition permit for that matter as well. So. Um, just so that you all are aware that is, uh, that has come into, to the city. Um, Eric, the, I, I don't think I followed you. Um, are you saying the, um, like the residence next to it is considered historical and not the church? That's, that as, that's correct. As far as the listings, uh, in the national, in, uh, in the state register, sorry, the, the rectory building is listed, but the church building is not. When the survey was done, I, it was either, the church building was either not quite old enough to be eligible or was just barely old enough to be eligible, and so they did not survey it. It, it was and like so 49 this, this years old. Yeah. I'm sorry, Abby, this, what? Um, the listing that in is enough to stop the demolition of the residents unless they get it delisted and then it can be demolished and is the permit that they're seeking right now for to demolish both of them the permit they're seeking is just for the church because that's as far as i understand it is part of the the sale agreement is that the church needs to be demolished and that's actually coming from saint uh saint francis uh, the parish is saying that so there, there was a letter that came along with the application that from the Saint, from Saint Francis, basically saying we've de deconsecrated the church. It is now considered a vile use, uh, as 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 canon canon law is uses that term vile use. It's doesn't mean that it's v somehow v i l e. Yes, yes, that's technically the, that's the technical term for a church that's no longer usable for church services and worship, and has been deconsecrated. Mm -hmm. So it's in vile use now, which doesn't have the same meaning as you're thinking it does. But because of <laughs> that, <laughs> because of that, the church is basically saying that they are fully supporting the demolition of this and the demolition is, is needed. So to ensure that the building can't be used for anything contrary to, uh, to, the, to the church, to the church's beliefs. Um, so they're the ones that are, are basically requiring this as a part of the sale. Who, um, who, can I ask who, who wrote the letter? Uh, one of the one of the pastors at the church, Father somebody. I don't I don't Father, have Father Royer. That's I believe that's correct. Yeah. So, anyway, so that is it's we have the application. Like I said, it's not currently complete. We still need the environmental assessment on the lead and asbestos, and then, as I mentioned, it would go through because it's coming in. Oh, sorry, this is what I meant to also add because it's coming in as just a demolition. So in the past, um, as a little bit of background, in the past when a property has requested demolition, like with, like with the mansion house, like with the property at Hood's Crossing at the old 223 East Allen Street, it, accompany, it was accompanied with a redevelopment proposal. So technically on our regulations, we would issue a zoning permit on the demolition and on we would, issue, we would issue a zoning permit on the demolition and the redevelopment. The, the zoning permit would cover both because the proposal included redevelopment. In this case, there is no proposal for redevelopment. So we would be issuing a zoning permit just on the demolition. Um, so in that case, again, it, it follows the same standards as any other zoning permit does with posting appeals, et cetera. So it's, it's slightly different in that regard where those other buildings that were historic in nature received a review from the state with a memorandum of agreement with the Division of Historic Preservation on how to mitigate the, um, um, how to 
how to mitigate the, the demolition, basically. Uh, in this case, it's, there's no development proposal, so it, it's just for the demolition right now, which could carry some adverse consequences when they go to redevelop. Um, it's what they call anticipatory demolition, so that may cause some issues in the future when, they, when and if they do submit a proposal for redevelopment, but that would, that would occur at the state and potentially federal level, depending on what they're proposing and what, what potential funding they might be seeking. So um, it's not a guarantee. Like I said, it could be appealed, but it's, uh, the, the application has come in. Just, I'm just going to point out here, this actually dovetails in with what we were discussing earlier about where the complementary structure is important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but again, that's a situation where the complementary structure is not listed. So right. there's no, it doesn't carry any protections or any, I don't want to say protections, but it doesn't carry the same quote unquote value as the listed structure right. or the surveyed structure. And just to point in again, yep, absolutely. Really, this is where relying upon the state survey fails Winooski. Yep, for sure. And we have no language of our own. To say we'd like to say well, I, I guess other than that it, re, uh, that it requires a zoning permit. Um, that's, yes, that's where, that's where we go to at this point. But demolishing it is a permitted, like we, it sounds like as long as they have their paperwork in place, that that's a permitted thing to do. And even if there's like some outcry to save that building, it's, that doesn't impact whether the, the demolition gets permitted or not. Well, I guess I would say the, yes and. Um, the, it, I guess it depends on what the outcry is. I mean, there's been a lot of talk on Front Porch Forum about what to do with the church. That's uh, obviously up to the owner of the church, what they do with it. Um, you know, there's nothing to stop somebody from appealing the, the permit and, and, you know, going through that process, which then goes to the Development Review Board for, for their hearing. And then potentially that decision could get appealed as well. So it's, um, I guess it depends on it depends on what the process is. We, I mean, there's a process in place going forward, but demolition is not a prohibited activity uh, mm -hmm. in in the city. So, and this um, brothers and sisters, the Handys, do they own a bunch of properties in Winooski? Uh, yes, they do. And like any that are, we would be familiar. I mean, others are probably familiar, but any big properties that you can name, I'm just not familiar with what other developments they own in the city. Oh boy, that's a good question. Well, so they, I believe are the, they have the proposal in for the, the Hoogaboom properties, um, which are the 379, 381 Main Street up by the school. Um, okay. they, they have conditional approval to redevelop those properties. Um, they own, I think they own property at the corner of, I want to say Main, Se Main Street and S Stevens Street. They own, yeah. they own a lot of different properties in the city. I, uh, it's, um, they also own in front of the school that, that oh, right. care and apartment right. and the old gas station. And I think the, okay. the building behind. Yep. They have a very okay. extensive real estate portfolio in the city. Yep. Yeah, yeah, they own the 401 Main Street, the laundromat behind it, and the kind of daycare apartment uh, to the north of it, in front of the school as well. Um, if you if you use the uh, the Regional Planning Commission's Arc Viewer for Winooski, you can click on all the different properties and see who owns them, and you'll you'll see their name come up quite a bit. Quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll check it out. Thanks. And we don't know. We, do we have any idea? I don't know, Brynn, Maybe you can answer this. Um, are they planning to do any kind of uh, affordable housing there? Does anybody know anything? I've had zero conversations with them about what what they want to do uh, or what they think they want to do. Um, there's there's been nothing. There's been no conversations that I've had anyway on on what what a redevelopment of that site might look like. Did you, and did you see that there's an article in Vermont Digger? I don't know if you read that. If you had, it, it talks about what they plan to do. They plan to do housing, is what it said. Well, that's about all they could do because it's in the residential yeah. zoning district. Right. So but they, I'm assuming the, the incentives that we just passed, if they don't choose to pick up on those, they can just do market, market value. 
Correct. Yeah. I mean, it would be it would limit probably what they the amount of density they could put there, the the number of units, and depending on what they do. Um, I mean, there's there's different <laughs> options, but it's yeah. It, and only one of our incentives deals with affordability too. So they could take advantage of one of them without, yeah. without that. But it was sort of what we talked about, you know, D kept showing up and telling us like the Winnie housing authority is a really good shot at this. And this is sort of what they need to make it work. And, you know, we even like pitch, like if you don't get it and it was like, no, 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 we, we have plenty of money. So. I, am, I must say I am a bit disappointed that the city didn't take a more assertive lead on coming up with a solution for this. Yeah. Because this was brought up many, many times at our meetings. Mm -hmm. So I hate to end on yeah, that so note, but that is the only but, other, uh, I think that's the only other update that I had. All right. Thanks. Thank you. And thanks, Brent, for your update. I, um, and I would just uh, um, kind of follow that um, for anyone that attending city council meetings really makes a big difference. So um, to the extent that you can email all the counselors any thoughts or opinions before um, council meetings approach or um, dropping in to um, share your thoughts about a particular agenda item, um, it, it has value. So. Um, I mean, we, we have a liaison, did, which is the mayor, did, as Joe was saying, we had a lot of conversations about this. Did this get back to the rest of the council, how we felt about this? I would say that I have not been informed. I can't speak for the other counselors. Okay. Okay. Um, other business? Uh, the only other thing I wanted to bring up is so we this is a, this is our only meeting in December so we will resume meeting again in January so our next meeting would be January 12th the second second Thursday um, again will be hybrid and actually that would be the last opportunity so starting January 15th the legislation that allowed for remote only meetings expires so we will have to go back to hybrid meetings unless the legislature re-ups that um, that legislation. So uh, January 12th will be our next meeting and unless we discuss at that meeting otherwise uh, the intent anyway was to go back to two meetings a month uh, in January so we would be meeting again then on January 26th I believe. So that's all January. I had for other business. Anyone else have any other business? Okay, seeing, seeing or hearing none, then I would ask for a motion to adjourn. Okay. okay. I found this on the web. Seeing or hearing none, then I would ask for a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Sorry. Somehow my phone picked that up. <laughs> Always listening. <laughs> I don't think I don't think Siri can make the motion, Mike. Sorry. <laughs> man, oh man. Did I hear Joe make a motion to adjourn? Abby made the motion. Abby made a motion. Well, I'm, Siri was talking to me. What can I say? And who seconded it? I don't know if we had a second. I think Connor wants to second it. I'll second it. Yeah. See in his face. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? Thank you all. Thank you, Brent, for, for showing up. Eric, thank you for all your work. And everyone, hope you have a great holiday season. Um, see you after the new year, if not sooner. <laughs>